Hello, my name's David Bruce. This is a piano sonata by Beethoven that I remember learning as a kid. I remember the feeling of being wowed by these long scales that always seemed to end up on just the right note for the chord in the next bar. It seemed to fit together like, well, magic. It may seem strange to start a video about jazz turnarounds with a sonata by Beethoven, but today I want to draw back the curtain on a technique that often gives music, all kinds of music, a wow factor, a little sprinkle of magic. It can be seen in the turnaround, but also in a whole range of other places, other jazz techniques like playing outside, Indian classical music, and yes, in Beethoven as well. It's a technique I'm going to call composing to a point. And I started drawing these connections together recently when my daughter, who is studying a bit of jazz harmony and is now a similar age to I was back then, asked me to figure out a little chord progression in this track, which is a remix by the producer Pomo of Mark Ronson's I Can't Lose. It's a really nice little progression. So I worked the chords out for my daughter and then I just casually said, oh, it's, it's a kind of turnaround, right? And she nodded approvingly. Now, being mainly a classical musician, the phrase turnaround isn't one I use that often. And it's definitely a concept I haven't particularly thought about in quite some time. But the fact that I appeared to have used it correctly in this case made me stop and think, well, what actually is a turnaround? Well, if you scan the beginner's videos on YouTube, you'll probably come away with the feeling that a turnaround is a slightly dull but possibly useful little trick. It's usually described as a passage at the end of a section which leads to the next section. And like the one I worked out for my daughter, it will often have four chords and a strong harmonic pull back to the home key. In fact, the vast majority of traditional turnarounds, I would say, are a variation on this progression. Now there's a thing called the tritone substitution, which is a phrase that just means you replace one chord with another that's a tritone away. And we can use that here to find three of the other most common turnaround progressions. You can substitute the A for an E flat. Or the G for a D flat. And if they're dominant sevenths, they can all slide downwards to the tonic. Or finally substitute the D for an A flat. And as major sevenths, this is known as the ladybird progression. And actually, even our Pomo progression is a kind of minor key variation on this, coloured by some extra jazzy ninth chords. What turnarounds often do is fill in a bit of blank space. Let's say our bridge section has finished on C, and the next verse also starts on C. So if we just sat there for two bars, we'd have some dead space, but a turnaround creates a sense of pull back to the start of the next section. And it creates this pull by either cycling through a series of fifths, like the one that starts on A, or by chromatically sliding down, like the one that starts on E flat. So on a small scale, the turnaround is the first example of composing to a point. We have our defined point at the start of the next section, and we build a series of chords backwards from that point. We erase whatever was there in that part of the musical structure before, and slap the turnaround on instead. S slap it! But turnarounds don't have to be just at the end of sections, they can be designed to arrive at a specific point in time. There's a series of chords in jazz known as the rhythm changes because they originally come from the tune I Got Rhythm. So the point we're aiming at is here where the phrase I Got Rhythm would have been in the original. So let's work our way backwards from here in a series of fifths, all the way back to F sharp. 
Again, we erase whatever chords were there before and put this series of chords in their place. That's a pattern used by JJ Johnson on his track Turnpike, which I learnt about in a video by June Lee, which I'll link to below. So the initial jump to the F sharp is kind of surprising, confusing. In many cases, the composer or the improviser will want to use a, a sleight of hand to smooth over the join, find ways to make the join less visible. But once that turnaround pattern of chords is engaged, we're off and heading inexorably for that point. The harmony pulls us there and there's a real sense of satisfaction when we arrive. This cycle of fifths pattern has been used by classical composers for hundreds of years. Here's an example from Chopin's Opus 10 number no. one. And I think you can really feel how the chord changes drive the music forwards. I mentioned the other jazz term, playing outside. This is another jazz concept where you use notes that don't belong to the main key of the music as a way of giving the music tension or movement. There are various ways to do it, but they often require a similar kind of backwards planning to make sure that everything lines up correctly. One method is to use a shape or a pattern that repeats in a sequence. Even though the notes of the sequence clash with the chords underneath, it seems to work as long as the sequence ends up leading us back to the inside territory at the right moment. Say for example we're in the key of C major and we have a 2-5-1 D minor G to C. Now instead of using the notes of those chords we instead use a shape and we repeat the shape in a sequence going down. The notes are all completely unconnected to the harmony, but they reconnect at the end as the final note of the sequence slides down to resolve on the tonic chord. So just as those chords in I Got Rhythm are worked out backwards to hit the right spot at the right time, so here the improviser needs to know where to start their melodic sequence so that it will end up at the right place to return home at the end. And just as those chords of the turnaround erase or take precedence over any chords that were part of the song structure, so the notes of the sequence take precedence over the main tonality of the music. Both this kind of sequence and the turnaround give you an initial sense of shock and confusion when unexpected chords or notes sound, but both then lead to a magical sense of wow when things turn out to make sense after all. It's a trick that instills confidence in the listener. With a lot of art, we put our faith in the artist. You might lead us somewhere unfamiliar and we're not sure we want to join you, but these are the tricks that composers can use to let the listener know you're in safe hands. The journey will be worth it in the end. Coming home to you makes it all worthwhile. The feeling of being confused and then wowed is one very familiar to fans of Jacob Collier's music. As with most things, Jacob tends to push these kind of tricks to another level, with progressions that are longer and even more complicated than those first examples. This little pattern is from the track Time Alone With You. It's definitely a turnaround, but to say it's challenging to analyse in terms of its functional harmony is an understatement. Even these chords, which took me ages to work out, aren't quite accurate. There's some other microtonal manipulation going on. The home key is E flat. The point of arrival is indeed some kind of E flat at the start of the verse, even if it's just really a bass note. And there is at least a repeating pattern here, but it's an extreme form of that playing outside. It's designed really to bamboozle us. If the whole track was like this, I don't think many people would listen to it, but it's designed to lead us dazed and amazed into the relative safety of the verse that follows. Here's another example from a piece called Ancona performed by the Jacob Collier Trio. Yes, Jacob had a jazz trio for a while, there's not much he hasn't done. So this time it's 12 chords in all, and here the strongest pull back to the one is that chromatic movement in the bass. 
But above it, Jacob plays another outside sequence, three four note patterns, which all lead to a resolution at the start of the next section. Again, it's harmonically very challenging to say much more than that, but here it's the rhythmic sequence that feels most important. And to me, there's a connection in this example to Indian classical music. Now what you've been waiting for, another long raga by Ravi Shankar. 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 Indian classical music is built on rhythmic cycles called tala. The tala cycles round and round with various patterns and accents stressing different parts of the cycle. And a tihai is a rhythmic and sometimes melodic idea that happens at the end of one of the cycles where a new rhythmic pattern is repeated three times so that the last beat of the last repetition hits the one of the new tala cycle. So listen to the percussion in this fairly simple example. And in this melodic example, the sitar plays a pattern that's seven beats long, with the final seven coinciding with the start of the new Tala cycle. So just like in the turnaround, the musicians have to calculate the right place to start their tihai by working backwards from the downbeat. And sometimes it's a pretty complex calculation. In this example from the end of the same performance, both tabla and sitar join together for a tihai that repeats a 664 pattern. At the very end though, this time the players avoid an exact repetition and instead tail off with a graceful downward scale. But I guarantee you that last note is still right on the beat. Tihai provides a bit of a final flourish to end a section, but it also provides a little more of that same magic we feel with a good turnaround. When the phrase finishes right on the one, there's a sense of wonder. Audiences will often clap in appreciation of a good Tihai. And it's a technique I found myself using from time to time in my own work. Here's an example which I may have shown you before from my trio The Eye of Night. So what about our Beethoven example? How does all this relate to that? Well, what I want to suggest is that this kind of backwards calculation we've seen in the turnaround and the tea high is actually a fairly fundamental part of music creation. Many of the most magical moments in music involve some of this cunning, this sleight of hand, this slightly devious way of making something that feels natural when in fact it's been achieved through careful calculation. <laughs> So as I said, I was amazed in that Beethoven sonata by how those scalic runs always seem to fit in just the right way. Now, you might laugh at my teenage self for this, but the idea never occurred to me at the time that rather than happening through just good luck, Beethoven might have known in advance which note he wanted to end on and worked his way backwards from that to find the starting note. But you can tell it must have happened this way round by those moments where, if you look very carefully, you can see Beethoven's sleight of hand at work. So take this moment for example. Beethoven has just finished one scale to land on the high B. And in the following bar he wants to end up on the D over here in the left hand. Now every other scale in the piece so far has started on the downbeat, but if he'd done that he would have overshot and landed on this unsatisfactory E. So calculating the space backwards from the D, it would have meant starting on an F sharp. But that in itself is rather ugly and inappropriate. So what does Beethoven do? Well, he breaks his own rule, throws in a little eighth note rest before the scale starts. And lo and behold, it now starts nicely on a G and the scale itself, as if by magic, has ended up on exactly the note that he needs. And that's just one example of how this kind of backwards planning affects all kinds of different music. And I hope in a video coming soon, I'll be able to show you some more examples in one of the most magical composers, Frédéric Chopin. So what do you think, Dorian? Do you think peeking behind the curtain like this to find out how stuff works takes away some of the magic of music? You don't, no, me neither. For me, 
just understanding how it works just makes it even more magical. I mean, those tea high things are just amazing. What's that? Yeah, you're right. I should really thank all of the people who signed up to Patreon after the last video. <laughs> That's a nice idea, but I don't think we'd ever get enough patrons to be able to afford a virtual cartoon bowl for your birdseed. But if that is something you'd like to see, do consider joining my patrons over at Patreon. Yeah, that's right, you'd also be helping me to make more of these videos, so two for the price of one, I guess. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.